Welcome to In China with Michelle Zhou. Manufacturers have long known China to be a leader in their industry, but now the world is recognizing China as a business center for companies, market traders, education, and artists. It's no wonder that the economy has grown to be the world's second largest. In our program, you'll learn from the thought leaders and professionals who have lived in both the U.S. and China and continue to do business there. Now, here is your host, Michelle Zhou. Welcome to In China with Michelle Zhou. I'm your host, Michelle. I'm the founder and the CEO of Pacific Technologies Consulting Group. We help American and Chinese organizations learn from each other, bridge their needs, and grow their businesses internationally. You can contact me at our company website, ptcgconsulting.com, and I always welcome you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Today, I invited Mr. Cameron Johnson to the show. He's an American who has spent over 20 years working in China. In fact, he is video calling from Shanghai. We would like to talk about how has COVID-19 changed businesses in China. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Michelle. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I remember last time we met was in Seattle. And I know that you are living in Shanghai. And you speak Chinese, is that right? It's a, yeah, Chabador. Chabador Hoi Shoda. Could you please first introduce yourself to our audience? Because you have multiple titles involved in many different things and also American communities in Shanghai, in China. Sure. I'm, uh, I'm originally actually from Bremerton, which is close to Seattle. And at the age of 19, after college, I became adventurous and decided to go to China. I ended up in a city close to North Korea called Changchun, which is in, nor in the northeastern part of the country, teaching English and history at a university or a college very close to Jilin University. After a year and a half, I actually went back home to Seattle to the UW for just over a year to complete another degree. And then September 11th happened, and there wasn't much work for somebody like me. So I decided to go back to China and get some international experience. And when I came back, I didn't realize that 20 years later, I'd be sitting here talking to you, Michelle, from <laughs> Shanghai. So, you know, it's been, it's been interesting. Uh, when I um, came back to China, I ended up in Shanghai. And I taught English for a bit, which at that time was, was a way that many younger people from around the world could get in to China just by teaching, you know, languages, French, Spanish, English, of course. And that's how I got in. And after several months of that, I applied and got work at a Microsoft joint venture called Microsoft uh, in Shanghai. And that kind of uh, started my career at the age of 23. So I worked for the JV for about oh, two and a half years or so. I started off as an English language trainer, quality specialist, and then kind of worked my way up being a project manager type. And then after that, I went to work at Microsoft itself, where I moved to Beijing, uh, and I served in the sales and marketing uh, training division called SMSG uh, for the greater China region. After that, I got a different job at Microsoft supporting the server and tools business back in Shanghai. So I moved back to Shanghai, and then I've been here ever since. So since that time, I left Microsoft or its joint venture in 2010. I um, then worked uh, at a company called Tiger Global, where we helped build the Costa Coffee supply chain. And those of you who are coffee fanatics in Seattle, like myself, uh, you know that uh, Costa Coffee was the UK version of Starbucks before mm -hmm. Coke bought it. And then for about seven, eight years, I ran a carbon fiber business, making material for uh, aerospace and automotive companies. Um, and then last year, I decided to go out on my own. So now I do very much what Michelle does, which is, you know, consulting, particularly for Chinese companies who want to go overseas or you know, foreign companies that are here in China who want to expand business or, you know, improve operations. So. Yeah, you're an American in China. You lived in China for 20 years, and I am a Chinese who lived in the U.S. for 20 plus years. Um, we all worked in Microsoft before, and at the end, right, we're doing similar things. It's just at different places, and it's it's great that we can find ways to. Uh, I hope we can find ways to collaborate more in the future <laughs> uh, with all this. I, uh, I agree. I mean, I think it's, you know, these days, particularly, uh, as you said, to our two countries are, are challenged in the relationship. And I think the more people like us can 
really help businesses solve problems, but also talk to each other, um, we can solve some of those challenges. So we you know, can move forward in a positive direction. Yeah, and I know you are involved in the American community in China. Uh, can you also talk a little bit about that involvement of what you are doing there? So I, I joined the American Chamber of Commerce in 2004, not too long after I got to the city and have been involved ever since. I joined the Future Leaders Committee about five years ago as co-chair, and uh, the role of that committee was to help young professionals such as myself and others you know, develop their career, you know, meet people of, um, of experience such as CEOs or COOs or senior managers, particularly the, in our industries or the field we wanted to be in. I'm currently the vice chair of the Manufacturers Business Council, which is our purpose is to really help, you know, manufacturers and supply chain companies that are here. And as you know, with the trade war and now with diversification and with COVID, it's a very busy job. And I've also been fortunate to, with the Chamber of Commerce, to go to Washington, D.C. as part of their yearly door knock, where uh, they uh, invite several members of the Chamber to go to Washington, D.C. to talk to members of Congress, you know, various departments such as Commerce Department or the Treasury Department, sometimes even the White House, really about U.S.-China relations, the business community, uh, challenges on the ground here, and also how we see um, you know, from our perspective, how we see the U.S.-China relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, so you are not just representing yourself. You are working with the members of the chamber. So you are representing, or at least you know a lot of information, uh, what's going on with the members. Today, I think uh, uh, I want to ask you this current situation in China, because last time was in February when you were visiting your hometown, Seattle, and you gave us a, a seminar. You talked about uh, what was going on in China under COVID-19. Now it's reverse. In the U.S., we have over two, I think, over two many confirmed cases. And then China, things are kind of uh, under control. Uh, Life was back in normal before. Now I, I heard the news that Beijing has something started again. So what's the situation in China now uh, related to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? How people feel so far? Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, uh, th many things have returned to normal. Um, there, you know, people are out in the streets. People are going to restaurants again. Uh, movie theaters are not open. Uh, that is one thing that has not changed. And yet with the current outbreak in Beijing, um, everybody's a little more careful, shall we say. Um, even ourselves, we, we're trying not to go to uh, places or restaurants with a lot of people. Uh, most places here have designed some form of social distance. Uh, usually it's about uh, three to four feet away, uh, the table, for example. Even yesterday, I was had meetings uh, in town very close to Xin Tiandi. People were lined up for Shake Shack. Uh, Starbucks had, you know, was full. So in terms of that, it's more or less back to normal. But people are, you know, everybody wears masks generally. Uh, people do stay further away. Um, I think partly to your point, there are flare-ups. So Beijing right now is facing that. Uh, I know several people who were in Beijing for a business trip, and now they return to Shanghai and are quarantined for 14 days. Wow. So they can't go out. So, uh, and everybody, uh, if you give me just a moment, everybody in the country has to have this um, green QR code, which I will show you mine. Shanghai, that's what the QR code looks oh. like. Okay, yeah, I can so, see it. Uh huh. That's the yeah. Shanghai you, green QR code. Uh -huh. How do you know it's and Shanghai or other it. places? Well, it tells you it's Shanghai. It says it's Shanghai. Uh, because we're registered in Shanghai. When I went to Qingdao, I had a Qingdao one, but it was it was under Qingdao. Businesses will take your temperature when you enter, hmm. uh, for example, a mall, or when you enter into a uh, building of some kind, they have an automatic temperature read that will read your temperature from two or three meters away. Um, but you have to show that green QR code, otherwise you don't get into the building. Um, so there's things like that. And I think one of the things that this system has allowed is that if you come into contact in an area or with somebody who has deemed to have COVID, your code turns red. And so they are at least able to track and stop COVID because of that. 
Um, I know in the U.S. there's many interpretations on how to do it, but at least here, because of the way the system's set up, and also they have so much data and so much uh, artificial intelligence that drives the machines, uh, they're able to stop it. So most of the people I know who are quarantined now who came back to Shanghai were in areas where there were many COVID cases in Beijing. Uh, those that came back that weren't quarantined were in areas that did not have it. Mm. Right. So, and the system automatically did it. Wow. And then they looked at their code. And, oh, I can't go out because my code's red or, or whatever it may be. So, um, That's yeah. amazing. All but this data. The, yeah. It is. It is. And in terms of the overall business, I mean, business for manufacturing, which is what I'm in, in industrial, is tough. Uh, orders are not very many, and particularly from the West, either Europe, Australia, or North America. So a lot of people are just trying to hold on uh, mm. and waiting for a better summer and maybe a better fall. I think uh, I would like to know more about how the business uh, looks like today. There are many different sectors that uh, have been heavily impacted in China. I think about the tourism, right? Airlines, retailers, right? They are all being impacted heavily. So um, I know you, you said you are involved in the chamber and you, you are doing consulting. So you are not just working in one company. Tell us whatever you know about those uh, businesses, the, the sectors that's been heavily impacted by COVID-19, how their business is being changed by COVID-19. Think about the business model and the, the way that they are approaching their customers before, what was before and what is now. What kind of uh, change you have observed on the ground? Sure. Well, in-person interaction, uh, just in terms of business, right? If I generally, you know, if you wanted to, for example, go to Starbucks. In the U.S., Starbucks is 70% takeout. But in China, historically, a Starbucks has been 80% sit-in. Mm -hmm. So now that business model has completely changed. Most either will have pickup or delivery. And a lot of that was happening before covid uh, with luck and coffee and the competition because that's what luck was doing so to catch up starbucks actually implemented many of the same strategies but after covid you can see an acceleration uh, if i go into a starbucks i almost never sit down now everything is on the go uh, if i go into most coffee shops uh, i don't stop it's either i order off of the mobile which is incredibly popular now uh, or i just go in order it and then when it's made i i leave uh, so that's one thing that has happened after COVID, where this is accelerated. Um, the second thing really is with offices. Office buildings now, and some people say it's because of the central air conditioning uh, system. Some people say it's because it's the amount of people that have to go in the elevators. Offices are not viewed as safe areas right now. Um, people still go to work, uh, but they'll go to work at different times. You know, they'll come in at 7 a.m. instead of 8.30, or they'll come in at 10:30, you know, and leave later at night or something like that. So, uh, one of the things we do see from a business point of view is that companies who were going to expand their office or who were going to hire new employees are no longer buying additional office space. Or if they were at a WeWork, for example, uh, they're no longer buying seats. They will hire people and then just have them work at home. Or if they do have to come into the office, uh, they came in once or twice a week. So in our case, for example, um, uh, Tidal Wave has two locations. Uh, we have about uh, 25, 30 people in Shanghai, and we have uh, 10 to 15 in Beijing. And the Beijing office for the second time now has been hit by the COVID-19 uh, scare. So one of the things we're looking at as a business is, do we have these individuals um, work from home now on a semi-permanent basis? Mm -hmm. So we'll actually save money from the rental and maybe, or, you know, maybe there'll be a few seats for management or for, you know, staff who need an office space or for a meeting room, but the rest of work from home. So that's uh, another area. Kind of the third area, and this was happening again a little bit in China, but everything related to digitalization and mobility has advanced, I'd say, by a decade in the last six months. Mm. What I mean by that is, Everything from delivery to uh, choices to retail or brands offering online solutions. And again, a lot of that was happening already, but because of COVID and everybody was stuck inside for at least a month, 
And now in Beijing, for example, many will be stuck inside for another month. You know, delivery, delivery drivers, delivery services, uh, online services, ordering with a mobile app is all critical to life. Not just it's convenient, you know, like you're on Amazon, right? Oh, I'll just order a book. No, no, no. If you want to eat tonight, you have to order food off of the app and it has to be delivered. So what we're seeing, to your point, is many businesses, Alibaba, a Meituan, even Tencent, uh, Tainiao, they are now, their business is growing exponentially because of this. Uh, kind of the fourth thing is in terms of the travel, and again, I went to Qingdao for business. Uh, the flight to Qingdao was almost full, oh. but the flight back was only half full. And on a normal day um, between Shanghai and Qingdao, those flights would be full all the time. There would be no... Uh, empty seats. And so what we're seeing now, again, is many people within the country, uh, they may take a day trip. So for example, in Shanghai, you might go to Suzhou or to Huashan or something like that. Or maybe even a weekend trip, you might go to Hangzhou or you know, Nanjing or something. Mm-hmm. But you are not flying across the country. You're not taking train rides, you know, five or six hours to go visit another city. So this is one thing we are seeing that is, that is new. As people are staying, not staycations, but we would call close-cations, you know, somewhere close by to where they're actually living. Um, kind of the fifth aspect is, to your point, is because the borders are currently closed, it's very difficult to get in or out of the country. So one of the things we do see is business is heavily affected by that. Um, you know, for example, if you were at Apple and you're working on the new iPhone, oftentimes they would fly engineers in to help uh, create it or redesign it, uh, that none of that is happening. Um, even executives who are trying to get into the country, um, all visas have been generally declared invalid, and they have to be issued special permission from the local bureau where they reside. Then it has to be approved on the city level, the national level, and then in the consulate or embassy where they're in their home country, they have to issue a new letter and visa. So it's a very complicated process. And then, of course, you have to fly back and there's not many flights. So uh, right. in our case, for example, in a normal situation, we would go back to Seattle again for the summer. You and I would have a coffee. You know, we'd enjoy, we'd talk, uh, potential business. But none of that's going to happen this year. And I think most people thought, okay, well, by the summertime, we'll be able to get back or we'll oh. be able to do something different. No, we're predicting this year, nobody will be able to get into China. And if you leave, you will not be able to get back. Uh, and I'm actually predicting until Chinese New Year because if the US, uh, North America has another uh, rise in cases in the fall, um, China does not want to import it. So it's a quite challenging. So most, in many industries, as you said, are also being affected by that. They cannot get talent in, meetings can't happen in person. You know, even to go to a Vietnam or a Thailand or Taiwan or Korea for business is impossible. So supply chains and businesses are suffering. And so it's becoming much more of a China-focused, China-centric uh, business plan for most companies now. So instead of uh, doing international business, they have to focus in the local market, the domestic China market. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with you. The, uh, we probably need to look at uh, until end of the year or next year for the U.S.-China travel. Because for me, every summer, I usually go to China. I spend my summer in China. And this year, there's no way to get there. And for, for my business, every November, we do the China International Import Expo. We organize American mm-hmm. companies to go to China. Now, we have still have some companies who have been there and they want to go again, but it's probably not looking very uh, optimistic for this travel. Yeah. All right. It's time to take a very quick break. We will be back right away. You are listening to In China with Michelle Zhou. You may also send an email to info at ptcgconsulting.com. Now, back to this week's program. Okay, now we're back. 
Before we took the break, we talked about uh, how it looks like in China today. What are the changes uh, of those companies or the businesses that uh, were challenged by COVID-19, uh, negatively affected by it? And you also mentioned some businesses uh, because COVID-19, they are in higher demand. Now, I want to change the topic a little bit. When China was having the pandemic, we saw a lot of news in the U.S. about it and uh, negative news. All this uh, panic or, you know, China is quarantine people and people have to stay in their uh, apartment, etc. Now, I grew up in China. I read the Chinese news as well as, you know, uh, I'm looking at the U.S. news. I do the comparison both sides. I'm very curious about what kind of news you have seen in those major Chinese media reporting the pandemic in the U.S. And how do Chinese people look at this? Um, well, with the pandemic, they oftentimes they are very surprised uh, at the response. Because um, uh, the, the Chinese government, I, I think once they realized how challenging it was going to be, as you said, they locked down Wuhan and then they started other measures that then help stop the spread of the virus. And I think, you know, having been in Seattle uh, with you when it all kind of started in Seattle, uh, it was surprising to see how slow things were moving and how people they didn't know, we don't know what's going on. We don't know who's doing what, you know, or what exactly the situation is. And then it just kind of uh, became worse and worse. Um, and I think people generally hear there's a sense of, oh, you know, you're, you're America, you're supposed to be such a great country, but yet you couldn't even stop Corona. You know, you couldn't even put it, things into place. Um, and there has been quite a lot of surprise at the response of different governments hmm. about Corona. You know, there was not a unified response, for example, uh, that happened in China. It was every state, every location, every hospital essentially was for themselves. Um, in our situation, when I came back to China, uh, I also uh, was asked by many friends in Seattle and others that I know to help with the PPE, with masks, with gowns, with gloves. So one of the things we've been doing since that time is we have helped them uh, source and get PPE from China. Um, mostly masks, you know, um, uh, but also gloves and gowns, you know, uh, millions of units uh, of each to help uh, with the challenge in the U.S. Uh, and in many ways, uh, again, surprised by the Chinese side about how unprepared the U.S. was, uh, even just in the supply chain. Um, and then kind of the other point is that many were shocked that um, some places would have a very strict lockdown, like uh, Washington State or New York, for example. Uh, but other states, Florida, uh, Texas to a point, uh, they did not. And so there was uh, even confusion here as to why would that be happening. Um, and so for somebody like me who grew up in the States but also lived in China uh, since I was a teenager, it, it's quite a challenge to try to explain, you know, the difference between, you know, we have a federation state and we're a republic and, you know, it's one of, the, one of my friends said, yeah, but people die from this. Don't they realize how serious it is? And of course, I, I didn't have a good answer for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, and they're also, in terms of, you know, here the media really plays it up. We'll look at America. They, how, how important and how special can they be when they can't even resolve this? China resolved it. And even when we have a flare-up, we lock everything down and it doesn't spread. But that doesn't happen in the U.S. So look at the difference between us mm. and them. Um, you know, so I think there was a lot of that. Um, there's also just in general, because of the tensions between the two countries, a lot of other challenges that I think COVID-19 has really shown to be even worse than we thought it was, you know, either whether it was the, the trade war or just the feelings. And I can tell you being here during this time as an American, even though I have lived here for so long, it does become quite challenging. On the other hand, being local, where my children go to local schools, you know, we eat at local places, we do you know, things that uh, normal Chinese people would do. There's also an understanding of, okay, you are here and this is where your life is. You know, you're part of the uh, community. So. Mm. 
Very interesting, the comparison uh, of this two country system and then people living in this, under these two different systems, trying to understand the other side is pretty hard. A lot of times I got questions or messages from my Chinese friends asking me, are you okay? I read this news, right? They sent me news about things like, uh, for example, in Seattle, all these horrible things happening. Are you safe? <laughs> they tell me they, uh, they're really, really worried about uh, what's going on. Then I told them, well, I basically stay at my home uh, or just to go to my community exercise walk, right? Uh, it's peaceful. It's fine. I'm okay. Don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, the media is influencing people and also the understanding of the diff different system is pretty uh, challenging. I uh, really appreciate you share what you have observed there. I would like also to learn more about how Chinese people, their attitudes is changing towards foreign businesses and especially in the tech space. Uh, I have been in the tech industry for 20 years and you were in that industry, you changed, you, <laughs> you did many different things. I think especially when the, the Huawei situation happened, right, that was uh, two years ago already, a uh, long time ago, um, mm -hmm. we see this mm -hmm. tension getting uh, bigger and bigger. And also President Trump blamed China for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. All these things happening these days. So do Chinese businesses, do they still welcome the Western products and the technology um, as before? Or do they start to look at things differently and maybe taking a more uh, nationalistic stance at this moment? I think to your point, it's a bit of both. I think the there's a big misunderstanding and also great challenges between the two countries, both in terms of expectation, but also in what is fair and what's not fair. Um, in the Huawei case, for example, you know, Huawei will say you're picking on us purposely. You're trying purposely to destroy our business so a Google or some other company, uh, Apple, for example, can come along uh, and make headsets and so on um, so we don't get the market. Um, the U.S. doesn't share that opinion. The U.S. will say, you know, you're using it for uh, things that aren't, that it shouldn't be used for. You're a threat to our national security. And to be honest, I, as somebody who's lived here for so long, I can see both sides. But I also think uh, those are very old arguments. Uh, you know, where this is the 21st century, it's 2020. Um, those arguments really don't work in today's world. Uh, to your point, a lot of what is happening with Chinese companies is they look, they're looking internally inside China. How can I build my own ecosystem? How can I build my supply chains? How can I develop technology independent of Western knowledge or know-how? I think that's a mistake personally, just because the more perspectives you have, uh, you can make a better product. But you're starting to see that more and more. Um, in terms of technology, you see a lot of companies who are trying now because they don't have access to the U.S. or European market, for example, they will go into a Singapore or a Malaysia or a Thailand or an India or other countries where they have more favorable uh, attitudes, at least towards Chinese technology companies, um, uh, to get knowledge and know-how. Uh, one of the things I find very interesting is if you look at what happened to WhatsApp just this last week or two, they are now putting in a QR payment system in Brazil, mm. which you know, WeChat did that in 2000, I think, 14 or 15. So they are many years behind. Uh, this is one of the areas that Western businesses have completely missed and where Chinese technology, I would say, is at least 10 years ahead, if not more, uh, of any Western competitor. Uh, if you look, for example, American Express uh, finally got their um, license to issue credit cards, but most Chinese now don't use credit cards. Yeah. Everything is used in a QR code. So it's a useless item. Now, with that, if they can have some technology or maybe they partner with, you know, an uh, – Alibaba or Alipay or WeChat Pay, you know, maybe they have some market, but it's a useless situation. So again, uh, it's missing and misunderstanding what's going on. I think kind of the really third thing is technology in China is moving incredibly fast. 
much faster than anywhere else in the world. Uh, just innovation, competition, um, changing of uh, ideas. So, for example, before COVID, you know, occasionally we would order food and some guy would come and deliver it to us. Now, since COVID, everything is delivered to us. Hmm. Our groceries, our food, our mail, um, you know, even things like this. My, my son loves goldfish crackers. So we even <laughs> bought goldfish crackers online and, um, and brought it here. And that does not exist, I would say, in the States uh, or Europe or Australia or other places um, as much as it does here. Uh, and this, these are innovations, homegrown innovations that do not exist anywhere else in the world. So when you talk about technology, I think there's also a misunderstanding in that, of how fast the Chinese market is evolving, how the technology is improving, how if you're a foreign or Western company and you bring the technology here, you know, they will always say, well, the IP, the IP, and that's absolutely true. You have to protect yourself. But if you make the product as good or better than a Chinese company product, oftentimes it will be adopted, as happened with um, and the Android system, for example. Um, and many Chinese, I think, do not have a negative point of view of many brands. Uh, for example, you know, they still eat at KFC, some of the most popular restaurants, fast food restaurants in the country. Uh, Starbucks is growing market share. You know, Coke is growing market share. Um, you know, so when you look at brands like that, what we would consider American brands, right? Um, you know, they're all growing markets and people are still using them. Now, will they use them less if there's an issue with Huawei? Maybe. That may be true. But I think generally, um, you know, many people see uh, a Coca-Cola can and it's all in Chinese. They don't necessarily think, oh, this is an American product because it's all in Chinese. Or you go to KFC, the menu is catered towards, you know, Chinese taste. They have yeah. um, the Otiao. They have the, um, the little tarts, egg tarts, you know, things that you would never find in America or Europe, for example. Um, pizza here, as you know, has salmon and squid and different kinds of fish. And that, again, that doesn't really exist in other parts of the world, maybe Japan. Um, so for foreign firms, a lot of it, a lot of the success in the market depends how much you cater and localize. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when we look down five, 10 years down the road, uh, Chinese companies like a Huawei or, you know, a Tencent or even, you know, Baidu, they have a huge opportunity ahead of them because they already dominate many parts of the Chinese market. And now as they start to go outside, they go to Singapore, Taiwan, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and then, you know, depending how things flesh out in the political sphere, you know, maybe, you know, North America or Europe or Australia or other places where they can grow their market share. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. And for American firms, again, um, I deal more with startups and, and SMEs, not really the big guys, so I can't speak for Microsoft or Google. Um, but a lot of the small companies look at it, and yeah, IP is always an, a challenge and an issue, but they look at it and say, if I can build my product here, and if I can win the market here, I will win everywhere, just because of the amount of competition, but also innovation that happens here. If you look at, for example, delivery, delivery has cha it changes about every three months here in terms of either the app or an innovation or one of the greatest innovations I saw during COVID was when your delivery driver would deliver food to you, they would have recorded the temperature of the cook, the temperature of the guy who packed the food and the temperature of the driver. Wow. Right. And they would have all of that listed. And when you got it delivered, you would have a little tag that showed the name and the three temperatures of the people, everybody who had touched your food. Wow. That's incredible innovation. Hmm. So again, uh, giving customers confidence that, okay, the people who are handling my food probably don't have COVID, giving the government a way to track an issue if there is an issue, uh, and then really third, this new innovation that did not exist before, and now they're trying to figure out how to do that electronically, right, so they don't have to write it down with each order. So, and these are innovations that do not exist anywhere else in the world. The financial payment system does not exist anywhere else in the world with QR codes. The ordering and the way every app links together. You know, I can order McDonald's, Starbucks, Coke, uh, groceries, everything through one app. You know, uh, flight tickets, train tickets, you can't do that anywhere else. 
So when you talk about innovations, uh, and again, to your point, the differences, those are some of the differences. I think we will see uh, continued uh, separation in some areas, but I think other areas, companies will realize it just because of the market, but also the innovation going on that they will have to be part of both markets. Mm. Yeah, China is such a big market. The company has enough capacity. It shouldn't just leave it alone. But of course, as you mentioned, it's very different. So China has a really fast speed. The business is there, you know, changes adapting, and people work so hard, right? So if we want to do business in China, then we need to adapt fast, and we need to work extra hard in order to keep up with everything and keep up with the competitors. What are some companies or brands or some sort of industry sectors that you think really get a a positive impact from this COVID-19 in China and what they are doing in order to really seize these opportunities. So we, we've talked about some of the companies, you know, delivery, mobility, the ease with which uh, apps have been linked together. Another area really is, particularly because I do a lot of work in manufacturing and industrial areas, is automation and robotics. And part of the challenge, of course, when you have an outbreak is people don't really want to work next to each other or even in a factory. So one of the things we've seen is a huge surge in robotics and automation. Sometimes it's just as simple as a cleaning service or a cleaning machine where they will go on the floor and they will sweep things up. Other areas is where they will have an automatic, we call them misters, but they have an automatic system where when you go into a building or in this case, I was in an industrial park last week where they had, in order to enter, you had to go through a series of automatic sprinklers that would sprinkle disinfectant on you wow. um, in order to get into the park. And everybody was the same. Other things, uh, for example, when you go into a hospital or you go into the subway or uh, many buildings, automatic temperature checks. Mm. Right? So these are innovations that may have existed before but really weren't ever used. Uh, and now they're used almost everywhere. Um, even beyond that, what you see uh, in terms of uh, robotics is uh, many companies now are investing in robotics. So we're seeing, uh, to our point earlier, about areas of technology that are growing fast. Uh, robotics is one of the fastest growing areas in China right now. Uh, and it was already growing, particularly in automotive and in those supply chains. But now you're starting to see robotics where visually they will spot things and they can make changes, uh, whereas before they wouldn't be able to do that. Or they will stop machines before because they can recognize patterns uh, before the machine will make a part that's incorrect. So we're starting to see some of this really being implemented in a larger scale uh, instead of you know in one or two companies or in a very niche uh, program. And then kind of the third thing really is just the interconnectedness and digitalization. Um, so this is an area, particularly in supply chains, where companies are looking at it and say, I want to know uh, from the beginning of my supply chain all the way to when the customer actually buys it. Every part of the process, every person, every machine, every company that touched it. Now, 3M does something like this already with their pulp uh, and paper where they will trace where the tree was and when it was cut all the way down to, you know, the paper that was made. You know, as you and I are both around IT and technology, a lot of it will be additional investment, um, but also just the ecosystems of uh, manufacturing. For If you're making an iPhone, implement a system like that. It's much easier because geographically you're not spread out, you don't have different languages, you don't have different cultures, you can more or less implement it seamlessly across the supply chain. So we're starting to see this. It will take several years, if not longer, to move uh, and fully be implemented, but we're really starting to see a lot of these changes because of COVID in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is so insightful. Well, I really appreciate you sharing what you have observed and the uh, you really look into it in a systematic way and being on the ground, right? Getting into these different industries so you know what's going on there. Um, okay, I think it's time to take another very quick break. And when we come back, I would like to hear from you what we can learn from U.S. side when we look into China, how people 
return to work and what are some special procedures or things people are doing in order to to stay safe. Are you interested in expanding your business to China but don't know how to start? Are you wondering how to grow your sales in the China market and win over competition? Meet Michelle Zhou and her team at Pacific Technologies Consulting Group. Our consultants are U.S. China experts and have all lived and worked in both the U.S. and China, with many years' experience in market entry strategies, management, and execution. We can help you find the right partners, develop opportunities, and grow your business in China. Please visit ptcgconsulting.com today. You are listening to In China with Michelle Zhou, and I'm talking to Cameron Johnson. He's in Shanghai. So the last part of this show, I would really like to uh, get your insights, Cameron.、Uh, think about what U.S. businesses can learn from China in terms of preparing returning to work. Because now we are doing the phase one, phase two, slowly rolling out, and with all these changes, right? As you mentioned in China, lots of things. It's very different than before. So, what are some changes we should make in the U.S. so that we can survive,、uh, or if for some of them maybe new opportunities they can、uh, capture and become、uh, even better? Sure. I think、uh, in many ways it depends on the industry you're in. And、uh, technology, for example, it's much easier to work at home. And I think a lot of what happened here is a lot of companies, even our own. Have encouraged people that if you want to work at home, it's okay to work at home. And what we've seen in many ways is kind of a move away from an office-centric business and much more into a either a home office, or if you do come into the office, you come in once or twice a week, or you know even in our case, for example, we often meet at a local Starbucks or coffee shop、uh, for meetings、uh, and not、uh, and a getaway from the office. In manufacturing, what we've seen. Is we've seen a much a clearer、um, demarcation between what is safe and what's not.、Right. Uh, for example,、um, in the factory I went to、uh, in Qingdao, they make aerospace and automotive high-end precision machinery parts. Every worker wore masks. Every worker was separated from each other by at least one to two meters.、Uh, every machine was moved away from.、Uh, Being close to another machine, so those were some of the things they had implement, implemented. They also did、uh, multiple temperature checks per shift. I think it was、uh, when you signed in and when you signed out.、Um, so those are some things that are very easy to implement. Another one that we've seen、uh, where it's been really effective is just communication,、uh, and particularly when China started to really open up again towards the end of March and April, we saw many businesses. Um, where they couldn't get workers back in because the workers were scared, or the workers were stuck somewhere. So what we found is you have to really communicate well with your workers. Your plan:、uh, if somebody gets COVID, what are you going to do?、Um, is there a, a testing regimen? Right now, you see this now in the U.S. with、uh, different sports leagues trying to get back.、Uh, I think yesterday,、uh, multiple players for the baseball team, the Philadelphia Phillies, tested positive. You know, when these things happen, what do you do as a business? How are you going to protect your staff?、Uh, now, I don't know if these questions have been asked. In China, they've been answered, and in many ways, it's you stay home, you stay away from the staff, or you go to a special hospital or clinic where you're tested, and if you're, you know, you're deemed as not being too severe, they just send you home for two weeks quarantine.、Uh, so these are things you really need to look at. One thing that we encourage.、Uh, Is if you're out and about, if you're dealing with other people, if you're talking in close quarters, wear a mask. And I know as as Americans, it's always challenging、uh, to be told what to do. We don't necessarily like that, but we found,、uh, at least in our business, that it makes our customers much more comfortable. It makes the staff much more comfortable.、Uh, and in the office now, to be honest, when we come in, we generally take off the mask. But again, we're spaced out. We're about a meter to two meter away from everybody around us.、Uh, and if somebody isn't feeling well, or somebody doesn't want to come to the office, they just work from home.、Um, in manufacturing, of course, it's more challenging. But again, I think you need to ask those questions. If somebody gets it, what happens? What are our procedures? What are our protocols? You know, do we have to talk to the local health department? Beyond that, how do we really communicate this to our workers?、Uh, do we? Um, you know, you have to work with the people you work with.
for example, if, if you're working in a factory and the person is two feet away from you and they have it, you're probably going to get it, right? Even if you wear a mask, potentially. So the real issue is what happens when they get it, okay? How do you quarantine? How do you test? How do you bring them back into work, right, when they're done? So these are things that kind of to your point that businesses in America should be asking. Chinese businesses have generally what happens when somebody uh, gets COVID or is tested positive, they're quarantined. People who have been in close proximity to them, as I, as I showed you with the QR code, their QR code turns red, so they are also are quarantined. Um, and then there's also a, a stage of communication. Okay, if it happens here, here's our next plan. If it happens again with a different staff or with whoever, here's our plan. Um, there are some office buildings, for example, now that do not allow central air conditioning because they're afraid it will come uh, through the air conditioning system. But Shanghai this week, there was a day where it was over 100 degrees, so it doesn't really work very well. Um, so again, in that case, they said, if you want to work at home, just work at home. You know, so I, I think part of it also is being flexible and really understanding that things are going to happen, so you just have to communicate well, plan as best you can, and when it happens, uh, and it's beyond what you think uh, was going to happen. You have to be flexible in order to uh, work through it. Hmm. Well, it's very complex, I think. Not one size fits all. Different right. uh, industry, different places. We need to all to consider this. What about the school? I know your son has returned to school in Shanghai. How did they do it? Uh, and uh, is it uh, safe? Yeah, so uh, in Shanghai now, what you do, they've, uh, they staged it. So high school students went back, I think, at the end of April. Uh, middle school students went back at uh, mid-May. And uh, our son, uh, he's in primary school. He went back, I think, the first week of June. So what they do is, is multiple things. The first is you have to record your temperature when you get up in the morning and write it on a piece of paper. You have to have a, a special QR code that's issued to you every day that you have to take a picture of and send to the teacher. You have to, as the parent, sign the form saying, yes, you know, I've taken the temperature. Uh, I do not think my child has COVID. And then you have to take all of that uh, with you, with the child, to class. Um, otherwise, if any one of those steps is not done, the child is not allowed to come to class. They did allow most students um, of classes to still stay at home if they were uncomfortable going back to school. But in our situation, we don't know anybody who didn't send their child back to school. I think once school's open, they're like, please go, leave me alone. When they get, so they wear masks to school uh, throughout the process of getting into class. But once in class, all the kids take off the mask. Oh. And they are about a meter apart from each desk, which is very challenging, particularly in a room of. Um, 30 plus kids. So they re actually redesigned the classroom to meet that. So that's what they do uh, for the education. And to this point, you know, we haven't had any challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in Beijing uh, with it is they just closed down schools again this week because of the outbreak uh, last week. So kids now are finishing the school year um, on their, basically on their iPad. Well, there's so many questions that I always want to ask, and you know so much in China locally, as well as because you are also watching news and following um, the international businesses. So you are such a great resource uh, uh, sharing with us about things happening. And there, I think there are a lot of things we can learn from China because China was a couple of months ahead than the rest of the world of the pandemic, uh, as well as uh, many months ahead then the rest of the world is returning back to work and returning back to school sure. um yeah i think time is very limited now uh we are getting to the end of this show um if people want to know more about what you do because your company is doing consulting now right helping businesses um where is a place that they can find more information and how can they reach out to you our, our business has two functions. One is uh, uh, recruitment, and the second is consulting, which is what I manage. Uh, and our goal really is to help businesses, uh, if they want to either enter the market or they're already here, um, to really develop operations to be effective. Uh, one of the things that has happened because 
uh, executives and technical staff cannot get into China is we are now taking a lot of that role ourselves where we will go into a business or go into a factory or go into a technology company and help you know uh, operations and run because staff and management can't get back into the country. Uh, we also help Chinese companies go overseas um, as well and deal with uh, those challenges but at the moment most are just staying here um, which is fine. Uh, if people want to find out more about uh, our company and what we do, they can go to tidalwave.cn. Uh, you can also look up my profile in LinkedIn at Cameron Johnson slash tidalwave, or just type in Cameron Johnson tidalwave. Um, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of us. Uh, and thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, having the time today. I know you are so busy. Um, it's always great to talk with like-minded individuals such as yourself who, you know, I think we have a lot of goals that we share, you know, helping bridge our two cultures and countries, but also making life and business more effective for everybody. Yes. Um, thanks for being on the show with us and sharing your insights. Uh, you are listening to In China with Michelle Zhou. I look forward to talking to our audience again next time. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to In China with Michelle Zhao. Please join us for another edition next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and 4 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. We'll talk again next week.